Morris and Warren counties, we do refer to that part of, bear, of New Jersey as black bear country. And we do, as you can see on this map, have bears moving throughout Bergen County and Southford as well. It's important to keep in mind, bears are native to our state, so black bears lived in the area long before people were ever here, and bears do require New Jersey's forested habitat in order to survive. Our state's forests provide black bears with all the food, shelter, space, clean water, everything that they need to live, and on the map up here of North America, where you see that blue color, that shows the current distribution of black bears throughout the North American continent. I want to direct your attention to these Midwestern states in particular, where you see a lot of white color, which represents where black bears have actually been extirpated, they're no longer found. Historically, here in our state of New Jersey, not that long ago, only about 60 or so years ago, we were nearing the point where we almost did not have any of these animals left within our state, but I will touch on why our bear population has been doing so well in recent years. It's important to mention black bears are regarded as a very valuable part of our state's wildlife heritage. Historically, the first people who lived around here, the Lenny Lenape Native Americans, used to use black bears every day to help them to survive from eating the bear's meat to using the bear's bones, teeth, and claws to make things like tools, weapons, and decorative jewelry they wear. They'd also remove the bear's fur and skin, called the bear hide, to make things like clothes and blankets, or when they built their shelter, they could use it for more insulation. Another part of the black bear that got regularly utilized by the Lenny Lenape was the animal's fat. Every winter, black bears get a lot of fat on their body in order to survive the winter months. When they're essentially going as long as five months without eating any food, people used to take that fat off the animal, boil it down till it was a liquid that they could burn for light and fuel. When they were cooking, they used it for liquid cooking oils. They even made skin creams and lotions and hair conditioners out of the bear's fat. So historically, black bears were a very valuable natural resource within our state. When it was just Native Americans residing in what we call New Jersey today, we had a very robust, healthy bear population all throughout our state's forest from Sussex County down through what we call Cape May County today. But a bit over 200 years ago, starting in the 1700s and throughout the 1800s, as European settlers started to arrive in this area, they started to cut down and burn much of New Jersey's forested habitat so that people could clear the land to plant their farms and build their towns and use those trees for lumber. So during that time period, we started to see a notable decline in New Jersey's bear population. In addition to losing that forested habitat, Many settlers regarded bears as vermin. They saw them as a nuisance or threat because bears would occasionally raid crops and kill livestock. So during that time period, bears were also over-harvested through indiscriminate killing. And essentially, the number of bears dropped down in New Jersey so much that by the early 1900s, we no longer had any black bears living in the southern part of New Jersey's forest. And again, about 60 or so years ago, we were actually nearing the point where we had fewer than 100 of these animals remaining in our state. But over the past, uh, throughout the 1900s, over the past 60 or so years, there have been some specific events that have taken place here in New Jersey that's given our bear population the opportunity to rebound to where we do have them statewide again today. And I just want to highlight some of those more recent occurrences. One important event took place back in 1953, and that's when New Jersey's Fish and Game Council, which is the entity that's legally mandated to set seasons and bag limits on game animals, they established black bear as a game animal, preventing it from being over-harvested through that indiscriminate killing. Throughout 19, uh, the years of 1958 and 1970, we actually had bear hunting seasons here in New Jersey for 10 non-consecutive years, but from that, only 46 animals were harvested. So at that time, Fish and Game Council, sportsmen and women of New Jersey, put a moratorium on the bear season to give the animals the chance to rebound. Now, throughout the tri-state area, adjacent states of Pennsylvania and New York, they had declines in their bear populations for the exact same reason we'd seen here in New Jersey. So right around 1970, they put moratoriums on their seasons as well. And it was actually throughout the tri-state region that we started to slowly see the black bear population rebound. Another thing that happened throughout the 1900s is that a lot of matured forested habitat began to return here in New Jersey for our state's bears to occupy. If you think of the Delaware Water Gap in particular 200 years ago, that land and a lot of lands in northern New Jersey were used actively for agricultural purposes. Those agricultural lands were left dormant and again forested habitat returned that our state's bears could occupy. During the uh, decades of 
the 1980s and 1990s, our bear population was regarded as manageable in our state. Bears were occasionally seen throughout northwestern New Jersey, but problems with black bears were few and far between. And at Fish and Wildlife, we actually started our agency's research work on New Jersey's bears back in the year 1980. So today, we do have about 40 years of long-term information on our state's bear population. By the year 1999, however, that particular year at Fish and Wildlife, we received more than 2,000 phone calls from people reporting bear sightings or some folks who were having nuisance encounters with bears that were breaking into things like their trash cans to get the garbage or ransacking bird feeders for the bird seed. So at that time, based on the biological data that had been collected through our agency's research work and the thought that the cultural carrying capacity was getting reached in certain communities, meaning bears in some towns were getting regarded more of a negative light because people were having some problems with them. At that time, Fish and Wildlife did propose a limited hunting season in the year 2000 to help stabilize the increasing bear population, but at that time, additional monies was given to our organization so that we could increase our research and management work, and also so we could try to do more in the way of educating the public to make sure that people, who, again, who were recreating around bears and living around them were really doing their part to help alleviate problems that we were seeing with black bears. And I will touch on our management work in a short while, but first, I wanted to let you know that out of all of New Jersey's wildlife, Black bears are the largest wild animal in our state. They're the largest mammal found naturally here in New Jersey, and that is a black bear poking its head out of the bear den site. I've mentioned they require forested habitat to live a little more specifically. New Jersey's bears really like to live in mixed hardwood forests. They also like dense, muggy swamps. There's lots of food in swamplands for these animals. And they like to reside in forested wetland areas. So on this map of New Jersey on the left side of the screen where you see all those different colors, it lets you see where we've got the best and worst places for the bears to be. The best place for them to reside is where you see all the dark and light green color on the map representing our good to best forested habitat throughout northwestern Jersey and the South Jersey Pinelands also have very good bear habitat. The worst place for them to reside is where you see the red representing our urban areas, but I'm sure you've seen those news reports where we do occasionally have bears showing up in some very congested locations like right around here, northeast Jersey, right in Paramus, other big cities like North Irvington, Englewood, um, they've all had black bears moving through. We've had a few bears skirting the outskirts of Trenton, our state capital in past years, and even down by Camden, New Jersey a couple years back we had some bears moving through the vicinity to give you more of an idea of where they can show up from time to time. We even had a bear down by the beach at Sandy Hook Point. Mm -hmm. The bear jumped off the point and took a little swim around the bay right by the ocean. So again, they can show up in some more interesting spots from time to time. And as bears have been spreading southward in New Jersey, we do sometimes get inquiries, well, how do you know a bear is showing up down in Cape May County and at Fish and Wildlife? When that call is received, we do have to confirm that sighting, so we get pictures of these animals as they're moving <laughs> southward. This is one of our bears showing up on our state wildlife management area down in Ocean County. We also look for things like bear tracks or scat on the ground to confirm those sightings. Keep in mind, while black bears are out and about in New Jersey's forests looking for food, these animals are omnivores. They do eat both plants and animals, most of the bears diet. More than 70% of the foods they consume come from different kinds of plants or vegetation. But bears are referred to as opportunistic omnivores because they are not picky about what kinds of foods they want to eat. So as I alluded to, here in New Jersey, we do have black bears hopping into people's trash cans to get the garbage. We have them breaking down those bird feeders to eat the seed and suet. We've even had black bears select things like dirty baby diapers out of the trash cans to pick on. So again, they're really not particular, but naturally in our forests, they are eating a variety of different foods. As I've mentioned, here in New Jersey, a bear could go as long as five months without eating during the winter time. So when these black bears wake up in early spring, starting in March and leave their winter dens, they are very hungry and early spring is a time of year where we have a big increase in black bears on the move looking for food. Potentially, those bears are wandering into residential areas looking for an easy snack as well. So if you do live in an area where bears occasionally come through the neighborhood, you've got to take some extra precautions in early spring. They might be in that trash can. But this time of year, they're eating all the plants that are starting to grow. They really like skunk cabbage that you see on the left side. As the weather continues to warm up, Bears are eating bulbs, fruits, grasses, tubers. They really like to climb up those fruit trees and get apples, pears, that sort of thing. And 
During the summer, if you are out there hiking, black bears are out there foraging on lots of wild berries. They love to eat blueberries in our state, so if you're picking some blueberries off a blueberry thicket, a bear could be right around the other side doing the same. They also like cranberries, blackberries, and raspberries are some of their other top choices. And when you are recreating outdoors, keep in mind, by late summer into fall, that is another time of year. These animals are actively on the move again, potentially going to those neighborhoods because that time of year, black bears enter into a period of hyperphagia, where they have to consume huge amounts of food in order to get all fattened up for those winter months. To give you a perspective how much food a bear is eating in the fall, every single day an adult black bear has to consume at least 20,000 calories worth of food a day, which is equivalent to me or you folks trying to pack down about 42 hamburgers a day. And they are eating lots of hard mast items in the forest, in particular lots of nuts like acorns and beech nuts while they're out there. If bears come across a dead animal carcass called carrion, that's a great source of protein, they'll pick at that. Occasionally another animal, like a deer fawn, could turn into a meal for a bear. And they also like to eat insects. Again, when you're outdoors, you might see some rocks and logs turned over where the bear's been foraging to pick all those bugs off the bottom. And because we do have so much natural food available for bears in our forest, they get quite large in our state and actually throughout the mid-Atlantic region because of that natural forested food supply. The adult male black bears referred to as boars typically weigh around 400 pounds here in New Jersey. They'll put on about 100 pounds a year until they top out. But at Fish and Wildlife, we have weighed them in more than seven, even 800 pounds. The record for in our state was 826 pounds, which is the size of a small grizzly brown bear. On the screen is a photograph of a larger boar our agency checked on a few years ago. Not too far from here, West Milford Township, we received a phone call to go to a shopping center where this boar was rolling over garbage dumpsters in the springtime. Again, he lost a lot of weight. He was looking to fatten up. And keeping in mind, he was a bit thinner this time of year. He did weigh a hair over 726 pounds. Now, this boar did manage to sever his nose while he was rolling over these dumpsters. So we actually called a local veterinarian out to come sew that boar's nose back together, which is what had taken place in that particular uh, photograph. Now, especially with the children, we all know you never go near any wild animal. So at Fish and Wildlife, the only way our staff safely handle black bears for research purposes to collect biological information on them is step one is we use our tranquilizer dart to anesthetize the bear. It's in a deep sleep for about one hour. There's no chance it will wake up and again we can safely collect information from it. The adult female bears are referred to as sows. They're typically smaller than the boar's wing, closer to 200 pounds, but at Fish and Wildlife our staff has weighed them in more than four, even 500 pounds because they are so healthy and robust. It also means they are very productive when it comes to having offspring. The territory that black bears like to spend their lives in here in New Jersey, it's referred to as the bear's home range. So where our bear population is the most dense in northwestern New Jersey, Fish and Wildlife has seen a number of sows that spend their lives in less than three, even two square miles. These animals do not need to move far at all in order to meet all their basic needs for survival. So on this map up here, that blue circle is supposed to represent a sow's home range compared to a boar's home range in red. The males will cover a larger territory and often their home ranges will overlap those of many different sows. That's helpful when breeding season rolls around. But something we have to keep in mind is where our house is or your campsite or where you're hiking could be smack in the middle of a bear's home range and naturally you'll have that animal coming through the area potentially at regular intervals and it's important we're not leaving out those unnatural foods like trash that might encourage that bear to linger and potentially be more of a nuisance in the area. Our agency has done a lot of research work looking at bears' home ranges, and there is a little bit of overlap with home ranges for black bears, but they are a solitary and territorial animals, so if they do overlap a bit, it's kind of like a timeshare arrangement. The bears are not going to be in the same part of a home range at the same time. But this map up here just shows you the depiction of a few sow's home ranges um, from information that we collected in past years from some of the research work that's been done. A couple other bear facts to keep in mind. Out of all of New Jersey's wildlife, these animals have the best sense of smell. 
black bears can smell food more than two miles away. So you really have to factor that in if you're camping or have bears that do come into your neighborhood. They also hear very well, which means for the most part you're lucky when you are outdoors if a black bear is in the area. That bear is typically going to smell and hear you long before you see the bear. Naturally, black bears do not want to be near people. They're typically very wary, shy, scared of us. So often that bear is gonna run away or climb up a tree before you ever even see it. But if one does encounter a black bear, as a quick overview, keep in mind, you want to stay as far away from that animal as possible. You don't want a bear, a bear to feel cornered where it's more apt to potentially act aggressively. You keep your distance, try to avoid direct eye contact. One of the best things you can do to chase off a black bear is make noise. You could start simply assertively talking toward the animal and say, go away bear, that might be enough to chase it off. You might have to get a lot louder, clap your hands together, stomp your feet. Some people will bang pots and pans together if a bear comes through their yard or campground. A nice loud whistle can be effective and air horns can work really well to try to startle a bear off. If you're out there on a hike, you could pick some rocks up and clap them together to make some noise. So you're keeping your distance, getting loud, and in a closer black bear encounter, you would want to make yourselves look as large as possible, waving your arms, hold your jacket out to the side. If you have children, make sure you pick them up, stay together in a group, look big, make noise, and slowly back away from that animal. You never want to turn and run from a black bear because they run a lot faster than we can, up to 35 miles an hour. Bears also have a chase response. If you've got pet dogs at home, you know, you run around your dog, your dog wants to chase after you. Bears are apt to do the same thing. If you run, they may potentially chase you, which is ideally why you're going to slowly back away from that bear. Don't turn your back. You want to know what it's doing. Continue to make noise look big and try to get to a secure location. And keep in mind with a black bear, if you do encounter one, you're never going to try to climb a tree to get away from them either because, again, they are great climbers. Bears are very healthy animals. They can live more than 25 years in the wild. They're also strong swimmers. As the weather warms up, folks might see one paddling around in a lake, splashing in a river, and on occasion here in New Jersey, People do see bears hopping into their swimming pools or fish ponds, and I'm not making this story up, but a number of years ago, Fish and Wildlife received a phone call from a couple who was trying to have a romantic time in their hot tub till a black bear decided to try to join them, so they really do like water. Another interesting fact about black bears, they do not always have black fur. Most of them here in New Jersey do, but across North America, you can see them with brown fur, and this photograph was actually taken up at Stoke State Forest in Sussex County. You can see that sow. Mother bear has black fur, but her cubs, what's called a cinnamon-colored black bear, looks more like a red-headed black bear in the state of Pennsylvania, sees a lot more of that color face than we have here in New Jersey. But if you were outdoors in our state and you saw a bear with brown fur, it's a black bear that happens to have brown fur, certainly not a brown grizzly bear, they're only found out west. If you did get a closer look at a black bear, you might see a patch of light colored fur on their chest. That's an identifying characteristic a chest blaze about 15% of our Jersey bears have. Now, if this video cooperates and plays for you, I wanted you to see a little footage of a boar wandering through New Jersey's forests because when black bears do move through the woods and occasionally through our neighborhoods, they'll often leave behind some different signs that indicate a bear's been around. So I just want to show you some photos of the most common signs of black bear activity. So again, if you are hiking, camping, or living around these animals, if you see anything like the pictures I'm going to show you, you'll know to take a couple of some extra precautions because a bear has been in the vicinity. So we're going to start with a picture on the upper left side of the screen, which is one what one might see on the ground in the forest. Some people even see it in their yard, and I did bring a fake rubber example of it with me today. The science word for what I'm holding is the black bear scat, S-C-A-T. Bear scat varies in appearance depending on what the bear's been eating. That upper left photo was taken probably about the month of June. That's a lot of blueberries in the scat. By the time they're eating lots of those acorns come fall, bear scat might look more like a pile of chocolate soft serve ice cream on the, on the ground. Scat is a good way. These animals are spreading seeds across the forest for new plants to grow, but again, it's a common sign of activity. One may also see the black bear's paw prints or bear tracks on the ground, in the mud or even in the snow. This is an example of an adult grown-up bear paw compared to a cub, and again, they can't get a bit bigger than this. When black bears walk around in their home range, they typically follow the same path through an area called a bear trail. When they're walking on their bear trail, they will often put their paw in the same exact spot while they're on that trail, and again, you may easily see those tracks on the ground. 
with the bear's sharp claws. They also like to scratch up trees and occasionally telephone poles. So you may see what is referred to as a marker tree. The bears basically scratch, bite, and rub on it. You might see some bear fur in there as well. They get it nice and smelly so the next bear walking past can sniff it and identify what other bears are in the area. I had quickly mentioned in our state of New Jersey, you have to be aware that we have an increase in black bear activity early spring, again in the fall, potentially near your neighborhood or campground. Another time of peak bear activity occurs with breeding season, which peaks in the months of June and July. Bears in our state can start to reproduce as early as two years of age, which is young, but it's because of our natural food supply in our forests. And at Fish and Wildlife, we have seen sows with litters of cubs into their 20s. Black bears are referred to as delayed implanters. So even though those females become impregnated during the summer months, those cubs will not even start to grow or develop until about five months later. Every November, if that adult female bear has put on enough body weight to survive the winter and support her offspring, at that time the fertilized egg implants in the sow's uterus and gestation's only about 60 days or so till those cubs are born every winter. Black bears are also polygamous and polyandrous. They do breed with multiple partners. That helps to ensure reproductive <coughs> success. And an interesting tidbit is that cubs in the same litter can actually be sired by different boars. The impregnated sows are the first ones to move into their winter dens here in New Jersey, and it's why the kiddos are out there getting ready to trick-or-treat in October. Boars are usually the last to den up, and it could be as late as January. Just keep in mind, at Fish and Wildlife, we've actually seen a number of boars that do not use winter dens at all, because we typically have more mild winters in our state. Those males might bed down for a week here and there, but they could essentially be out and about throughout the winter. So again, you may see a bear out and about all winter long as well, so you do have to take extra precautions. Most of the bears do stay put about five months, and when they do den up, those photos on the screen show some of the more common den sites our Jersey bears like to use. In northwest Jersey, some bears do squeeze inside of small rock cavity dens. Other bears might actually dig out holes in the side of hills called excavation dens. A hollow tree space could make a nice den site for a bear. Many bears actually build nests right on the ground in the forest. Called a ground nest den, they curl up and let the snow land right on top of them. That snow adds a layer of insulation to keep that bear nice and warm. So for any of you ambitious grown-ups in the room or children, before you guys head out, if you're interested, I did bring these two boxes up here, which are examples of bear dens, to give you an idea how small the den space can really be. For those of you who think of Yogi Bear snoozing in a big rock cave, it does not work like that. I've got a small gray box up here where at Fish and Wildlife, our agency found a sow who weighed nearly 300 pounds, larger than me, hibernating in a small box like that. And in a real uh, tree den, about the size of this gray box, we found a female that weighed close to 200 pounds by that brown box, excuse me. So again, it gives you perspective just how small their winter den sites can really be. And at Fish and Wildlife every year, our agency does get a few phone calls that, from people who realize that they've got black bears denned up under their house like a porch or deck. So those are some of my, co uh, some of my colleagues under people's homes with hibernating bears, and we'll talk more about that in just a moment. And again, the only way our staff safely gets close to them is step one is that they are anesthetized. So often folks do think that once black bears do make their ways into their winter dens, well at that point, then you don't have to worry about seeing it till it wakes up and leaves its den in spring. But black bears are not true hibernators. Every winter, they only go into this light, <coughs> groggy state of sleep called torpor. Basically, their body temperature does not drop down enough to keep them in a really deep, deep state of sleep, and consequently, they can wake up very easily throughout the winter. So if you were hiking along and came across that ground nest den where the bear's snoozing, you might start a little awake and it's going to run away from you. Or on more mild winter days, bears may decide to leave their dens and go look for food, potentially in your neighborhood. So one does have to take precautions again year-round if bears are in the area. Every winter in the month of January is when the cubs are born in our state. They weigh less than a pound. They're basically blind their first month of life. They don't open their eyes till they're about 30 days old. And again, they weigh less than a pound, but they grow very quickly. So by the time Fish and Wildlife staff are checking on them every March, they weigh about five pounds. Some of the chunkier ones could already weigh 10 pounds that time of year. Those cubs grow so fast, by the time a cub turns one year of age, it could already weigh more than 100 pounds, most average about 80 pounds by that first year. 
So I mentioned sows in New Jersey are very productive. We do have above average litter sizes of cubs compared to black bears elsewhere in North America because of that natural food supply. So the average litter size in our state is three cubs in a litter. But at Fish and Wildlife, we have documented a number of adult females with as many as five, even six cubs in a litter. So this photograph was taken not too far from here, Butler Township, back in, I believe, the winter of 2017, where that particular winter, we handled two adult females who had six cubs, and Butler and then over in Jefferson. So these are some of the Black Bear Project staff that work at Fish and Wildlife, and I'd like to direct your attention to Mike Madonia. He's the current Black Bear Project leader for our state. So if one ever has questions or problems and needs to call the Fish and Wildlife, these are our experts who can assist. And the adult females with those cubs start to leave their winter dens in April here in New Jersey. The females are very good teaching the cubs how to survive and where to forage for food, but one thing we want to make sure we're not seeing in our state are these cubs finding those unnatural foods near people, so that sow is actually teaching her cub how to dumpster dive. They start out young, <laughs> it's okay to find food near us, and it definitely leads to problems as those bears get bigger. The cubs do very well surviving their first year of life, 70% make it through that first year. By the time a cub turns one year of age, when it's then referred to as a yearling or subadult, its survival rate actually goes up to close to 90%. As a family unit, those cubs will only stay with that adult female for about a year and a half. Once they're 18 months old, they're big enough to go live on their own, and that's when that adult female goes into estrus to breed again, and she actually boots those yearling bears out. Every June and July is a time of year those yearling bears are dispersing and they might wander into some more suburban areas when they are looking to establish their own home range where they don't have to compete with other bears in the area. So keep in mind these adult females typically have litters of cubs every other year, not every year. So if you can hang in there with me for a few more minutes, I did want to talk with you a bit more about the research work that Fish and Wildlife has been doing again for nearly 40 years on our state's bears. So if you do happen to encounter a bear that's wearing some of the research equipment, you'll know what that is about. But essentially every year we go out and do three big types of research work on our state's bears so we can look at the health of our bear population and figure out how many bears we have residing in parts of our forest through our marker capture work. So this uh, picture of Northwest Jersey shows our current research study area. Essentially, it's along the Interstate 78 corridor and to the west of 287. Every spring and then late summer, our scientists go out and do what is called research trapping, which allows us to do that marker capture work on our bears, again, to figure out population estimates and determine how healthy the bears are. It's kind of like when we go to go see the doctor for our checkup, the bears essentially get a checkup. So when we capture bears for research purposes, we use one of two types of humane bear traps that are used internationally by wildlife biologists. On the left side of the screen, you'll pick, see pictures of the Aldrich foot restraint, which is a cable loop. It goes around the bear's paw. The bear can run around the tree and climb it. And in more of a residential setting or near a campground, if we're capturing bears, we use what's called a culvert trap. The bear walks in, the door shuts behind it. We check these traps every day. The animals are not in there long at all to entice a bear into a trap. We do take advantage of that great sense of smell, however, and we'll bait it with stuff that smells pretty good to the donut, to the bear, like donuts, uh, old bacon and cake, stuff like that. Once we've got the bear in a trap, we can use our jab pole with a tranquilizer dart at the end, anesthetize the bear. It takes about 10 minutes for the medicine to take effect, and then once that bear's in a deep sleep, any time a black bear is ever handled by Fish and Wildlife, our agency always puts a set of metal tags inside the bear's ears. Some bears also get to wear these larger cattle tags too. I think you can see that there's a number on the cattle tag, so just like we've all got our own name, every bear gets its own identification number so that we can keep track of that animal and know what bear is what bear. Occasionally <coughs> these ear tags could pull out of the bear's ear if it got into a fight with another bear, so while the animal is asleep, we will also give the bear a tattoo. We will write or tattoo the ID number on the inside of the sleeping bear's upper lip so that bottom right photo does show a bear who's getting a tattoo. While the animal's asleep, we want to determine the age of the bear if we've never handled it before. To learn the age of the animal, we actually look at a small tooth inside the bear's mouth. This is my plastic bear skull behind the big canine tooth. There's a small premolar tooth that the black bear does not use for anything. We can easily extract it and take it out and send it off to a laboratory where it's essentially cross-section cut in half and they put some stain or dye on it. And then the inside of the bear's tooth, it looks a lot like the 
the inside of a tree, which you know has growth rings. So we can count the rings in the bear's tooth and learn the age of the animal. We do take blood from the bears to look for diseases, a lot of tick-borne diseases like babesia, toxoplasmosis um, is another one, and West Nile virus. We'll take a little tissue sample from the bear's ear as well to look at the animal's DNA and learn about what bears are related to what bears. We weigh and measure them to see how quickly they are growing in the forest. On the left is another larger boar we handled a couple winters ago, weighing in here over 736 pounds. And some of the bears we check on every year are also fitted with bear tracking collars called radio collars. So if you like to watch Animal Planet, you might see biologists put these on wildlife throughout the world. With these radio collars, it lets our scientists track the bears so we can learn about where they're living, learn about their home range, we can see how long they live for, and then we can find them every winter when they're in those bear dens. When the collar's turned on, it gives off a radio signal that we can listen to with a headset antenna receiver, and then we can locate those bears. In the past, we've also used <coughs> fancier satellite collars that use GPS, which allow us to just sit at the computer and watch the animal's movements. So this uh, map on the screen shows the <coughs> movements of a boar a number of years ago um, that we handled, and it lets you see how much turf they can cover. So basically, the interesting story about this male is we first handled him and put his radio collar or satellite collar on, excuse me, in Parsippany. And he managed to take himself down to the Lakehurst area, Ocean County, where he spent that winter. When he woke up and was done uh, denning up, we took his collar off and sent him on his way. And then about a year later, the following fall, we caught him on one of our research lines in Warren County around Alamoochee State Park. So he covered, managed to cover a huge swath of northern and central New Jersey. And again, we do use the collar so that we can locate these bears every winter so that in the months of January and February, we can check on the adult females who have those yearlings to see how many cubs survived that first year of life. And then every March, when the cubs of the year are big enough to get handled, we will count how many cubs are born into the bear population. They get weighed, sometimes measured, and they, only, they get their own set of metal ear tags as well. We also put a little microchip in them like many people will put in domestic pets. And based on all the bears, our scientists handle every year. Again, they can figure out how many bears are living in parts of New Jersey's forests. So if you remember way back when I started rambling, I mentioned not long ago in New Jersey, about 60 or so years ago, we had fewer than 100 bears left in our state. And today, just in northwestern New Jersey, we have about 2,400 bears as of our last official uh, bear count in 2016. So our bear population is doing very well. The fact that we do have black bears showing up throughout New Jersey lets us know that we have a healthy environment in our state. But with this map, I want to show how it's really been over the past 20 or so years that we've had a notable expansion in our state's bear population as the numbers have increased. So in recent history, as of the year 1995, only these townships in that dark reddish color in northwest Jersey have had confirmed bear activity. But as the number of bears continue to increase in that part of the state, again, our females are very productive. We have low mortality rates here in New Jersey, so if we're having more bears show up, they were getting pushed further eastward and southward in New Jersey to find their home ranges to occupy. And by 2007 into 8, we confirmed bear activity in all 21 counties again. Again, bears are regarded as a very valuable part of our state's wildlife heritage, but as I mentioned, problems do sometimes occur when basically bears start to find food near people. So we call that process where bears become really comfortable being around us because they found food near us. We say those animals are habituated. They're not faced by the sights and smells of people anymore because they're so used to eating out of our garbage cans and being around us that again, they're a lot harder to potentially deter if they show up in a residential area. So bears become habituated through different avenues. People love to feed wildlife, so you may just want to feed the birds, turkey, deer, and bears take advantage of those foods. Other times, we have had people who are deliberately feeding these animals, like that's a bucket of Twinkies you see in the background there. <laughs> the cubs start out young, finding food near people, and again, we know it leads to problems and extreme situations, like in that photograph where that person's trying to hand feed a bear a donut, but once bears learn that type of behavior, it leads to extremely negative repercussions for the bears, and obviously that's a very dangerous situation for that person as well. We have towns that swear the bears have figured out garbage collection days every Thursday morning. So when the bears come down the street, the bears are out 
they're getting into those containers, again, because they're so habituated, and once they lose their fear of people, they're a lot harder to chase off. We get calls from people who can't go out on their back deck. They can't chase the bear away. We've had people who could not get in their cars in their driveway because bears were lounging across those warm hoods, sunning themselves, and people could not chase them off. And again, they then can show up in some more surprising spots. That's a bear that showed up in a parking garage in Somerset County a couple years ago. And again, it can lead to more dangerous situations as well. Now, this photograph was taken a while back at Worthington State Forest after that boy and his father had been hiking in the forest and saw a bear and made the very poor decision to try to give the bear food to get some close-up photographs of the animal. So they did get some pictures of the bear, but when they turned to walk away, the bear smelled all the food in the child's backpack, tried to get the pack of food, scratched the child, and thankfully that kid was okay, but his father did have to pay lots of money and fines and do assembly programs on why you never feed the wildlife. And since that incident occurred, legislation was passed in New Jersey, so today it is illegal against the law. You are not allowed to feed bears in our state. But since the year 2000 or so at Fish and Wildlife, we have used our category system to respond to any calls and complaints that we hear from people pertaining to bears. So I just want to quickly fill you in on the most common calls and problems we hear about with bears and what our agency is available to do to assist. Now, if somebody just sees a black bear that's not posing a threat to public safety or causing any kind of da damage, it's just carrying on its way, and you call Fish and Wildlife, we will note that you saw that bear, but our agency does not respond. On occasion, though, these Category 3 bears are the ones that do show up in extremely urbanized locations. Now, if a bear does show up in such an urban area, like the heart of Newark, New Jersey, like we've had, when the bear has treed itself, if it cannot safely get out of that city, that is the only time Fish and Wildlife will ever go in and move a bear out of an urbanized area. If that bear does have to be taken out of that city, it is taken to the closest state land that has suitable habitat for that bear. If somebody calls to tell us a bear got into their bird feeder, we say, please take that feeder down so that animal's not becoming habituated. The number one nuisance call we consistently hear about deals with bears getting into trash, and that's considered an example of a Category 2 bear that's posing a minor nuisance in the area. So we really need people to secure those garbage dumpsters and regular trash cans and recycling containers. And this is one more video I wanted you to see that lets you uh, see how quickly and easily, excuse me, bears can break into traditional garbage cans and garbage dumpsters. So this is a sow. We had done a dumpster study project up in Vernon. She's wearing one of the fancier satellite collars, and she's got both types of tags in her ears because she was involved in the separate <coughs> research project we were doing. And with her excellent sense of smell, she can smell all the trash in that dumpster. And again, this just shows how easily they can hop in there to get themselves a snack of garbage. Go in there and get the goods. And at Fish and Wildlife, we do hear about people who just love to see the bears, so they don't mind that a bear is eating out of their trash can, but we know this behavior leads to problems. In that particular community, people could no longer go throw their trash bags in the dumpster because they had black bears aggressively charging at them trying to get the garbage from them. We don't want things like that occurring. Category 2 bears may cause minor property damage, which we consider less than $1,000. That upper left photo was taken where a bear had been scouting out a den site under that person's front porch. The bear did some landscape damage, broke the lattice. If somebody has unprotected livestock or beehives and a bear gets into them, that's Category 2 behavior. And if you send your pet dog out in the yard to chase a bear away and your dog gets hurt in that circumstance, that's stance, that's just a very poor decision by that homeowner. So with our Category 2 bears, we try to work with the callers to make sure they are removing whatever is attracting the bear into the area. On occasion, though, we have such habituated bears that a campground may have done a great job securing their dumpsters, cleaning up trash, but bears keep going back to that spot. So on occasion, Fish and Wildlife or local police might go out and do what's called aversive conditioning on the bear, where we essentially give it a very negative, scary experience to try to chase it off. So with aversive conditioning, we'll often set one of those culvert traps where we don't want the bear. When the animal's released, it's shot at with rubber buckshot. It's not lethal, but it stings and scares them. We'll use loud pyrotechnic discharge noises to startle them off. And in past years, our agencies also used bear dogs, which are black mouth yellow curs. They have no fear of black bear. 
So they do run after them, bark at them, chase them up trees, and the idea with this averse conditioning again is to scare bears out of the area. And we know it's only a short-term fix. It can help for a couple weeks, but if people get sloppy with their behavior, those bears are coming back. And just know in an emergency situation with a black bear, call your local police department. They can respond right away. Fish and Wildlife does train law enforcement in our bear response techniques all throughout northern and central New Jersey right now. Um, so they can respond right away. Most serious cause complaints, we get our Category 1 bears, which are regarded as a threat to public safety or they are causing extensive property damage. And examples of that behavior include bears that are breaking into or trying to break into the homes, garages, and sheds. And we know it's not a behavior a bear just decides to do one day. These are those habituated bears smelling something good in the kitchen. They take it one step too far. Vehicle entries and tent entries are considered Category 1. Bottom right photo was taken at a private campground near High Point. After a young girl had gone to sleep after using a smelly skin cream product, she woke up to a bear dragging her off the cot. Thankfully, she was okay. And when you guys are recreating outdoors in past years, things have been do going very well at our state parks. They've got very specific protocols people have to follow, but a number of years back, bears are intelligent animals. They figured out what coolers were. So if people were leaving coolers on the seat of their car, bears were breaking into the vehicles to access that. So if you ever are leaving food in your car in an area with bears, if it's in the cab of your car, you want to cover it up in airtight containers or ideally leave it in your trunk in those airtight containers. Other examples of Category 1 behavior include bears that are getting into crops or if you properly protect your pets outside and livestock and bears still get into that. We consider that Category 1 along with unprovoked dog attacks. Our beekeepers have had a lot of success properly um, installing things like electric fencing around apiaries to keep bears out, but if bears still get into that, that's Category 1. Significant property damage is over $1,000. And conceptually, the scariest idea with bears are human attacks. I want to take a moment again to try to reiterate the nature of a black bear is typically that they want nothing to do with us, but these are wild animals and unpredictable potential, uh, potentially aggressive behavior can occur. So people certainly have to use precaution, common sense, and keep your distance. Now this photo on the screen was taken a number of years ago now in Sussex County after this man who worked on a golf course was fixing some equipment out on the golf green and a sow that lived adjacent to that golf course actually rushed at him and jumped on top of him. This is a big guy weighing more than 300 pounds. The sow is about 140, so he did successfully fight her off. And I'm sure many of you are aware that we did have a tragic fatality that did occur here in New Jersey back in 2014. Again, it's exceedingly rare that that type of behavior will happen, but we certainly need people to do their part and secure those unnatural foods so that bears are potentially not becoming a nuisance. So in addition to that category system, again, we try to educate the public, and I promise I'll be wrapping up shortly, and if you haven't already, before you head out the door, we do have our publications, a lot of info on our website, and our staff is always available to assist with any calls and questions. As our bear population has spread statewide, however, in recent years, folks do sometimes inquire as to whether or not there are fertility control options that can be used to stabilize the bears. It's important to mention Fish and Wildlife, our Fish and Game Council, is committed to research in this area. We do issue permits to different organizations, but at this time there's nothing FDA or EPA approved in, ster in terms of sterilization drugs or contraceptive uh, techniques that can be used on wild, free-ranging bear populations. So way back when I started all this, I quickly mentioned in 1999, we got more than 2,000 phone calls from people reporting bear sightings or problems, and I hope at this point you know that refers to those category 321 calls, and since that time there's been a lot of ebb and flow every year based on a number of different factors like natural food availability, but we certainly need people to do their part to help alleviate problems that we're seeing with bears. So as a quick overview, I mentioned the biggest problem we have is bears getting into those trash cans, so we really need people to secure garbage. If one has regular problems with bears getting into their trash can, the best option that's available is to use what is called a certified bear-resistant garbage can or dumpster. Now there is a captive grizzly center out in the state of Montana where manufacturers can now send their garbage cans to test them with grizzly bears to make sure the bears cannot break into them. And those containers and dumpsters that pass that uh, protocol are the best that one can purchase and utilize. So there really is the best option available for people. And we have a lot of info about those certified cans on Fish and Wildlife's website. And we do tell people all it takes is for a bear to access food one time on your property. They've got great long-term memories. It could be two years down the road, but if the acorn crop's not too great one fall, those bears are potentially going to come back and look for a snack on your property. 
If you do have bears getting into trash, recycling containers, we do encourage folks to try to disinfect them regularly to minimize odors. Some people swear they have success using mothballs or rags that are in a bleach water solution. It depends on the bears. Some bite right through that, but it certainly doesn't hurt. Uh, we also want to make sure trash is always going into containers. And you have to be really careful where you keep your trash or recycling. If you've got a certified can, you're lucky. You leave it outside. The bear can't get into it. it might go to your neighbors and get into theirs. But if you do have garbage in a garage, you want to ideally keep it on the back inside wall. Again, intelligent animals, bears have figured out. People leave food in garages and sheds. And some streets have had garage door after door broken into by bears. So one does have to use precaution where you store that stuff. We also encourage folks to get up bright and early, morning of garbage collection, to keep uh, put your garbage out so the bears don't jump in all night long. Where I showed you that dumpster diver, Sal, before, that community had to use certified lids for a while, and they did have a lot of success alleviating problems with bears. We say our Jersey bears should probably have feathers for all the seed and suet they eat, so we do encourage people to take down those feeders if bears get into it. It's also like if you go camping and you ever want to put your uh, food or trash up in a bear bag, Feeders, bear bags, they have to be hung way up high, at least 10, 15 feet off the ground and away from any little tree limbs the bear's going to climb out on. With bird feeders, you want to put them out when bears are least active, keeping in mind you still might have a bear in the area. Try to use spill pans, never hang a feeder off the side of your house. We've had bears try to go up siding and uh, gutters to try to get to those and certainly bring them indoors at night. If you feed pets outside, you could have a bear eating out of the dog food bowl or cat food bowl, so you want to pick up those bowls and scraps right away. And as the weather warms, bears love to lick people's barbecue grills clean if they haven't done it properly. So you really need to clean those grills, utensils, and secure them. If you go camping, a lot of people like to take that grease residue when they're done camping and they'll bury it. Bears will smell that and come dig that stuff up. So you want to make sure that you are securing all of that with your garbage and keeping it away from where a bear might pick up on those scents. If you compost, you never want meat, dairy, or sweet stuff in there. If bears come through the area. Liming can help with decomposition as well. And if you have fruit and nut trees, that is a big bear attractant. So if you want to minimize bear activity, you have to be very diligent picking up whatever falls on the ground and discarding of it. Same thing with vegetable gardens. You want to um, harvest those regularly too. So basically, if you have stuff on your property or if you're in an area with lots of bears recreating, you want to keep things as out in the open as possible. Bears do like it. If they can run from the forested corridor, grab a snack, and head back to a sheltered area, and we'll take advantage of that. So if you do keep things more out in the open, it might help to deter bear activity. But people throughout northern and central Jersey now who have had the most success alleviating some problems with bears, they've gone so far as to properly install, bait, and maintain electric fencing. And we've got a lot of info on our website about that. If it's done properly, it is safe for people, and it's also, again, very effective keeping bears out. While you're driving